In this episode, I host a dialogue between Damarato and Daniel Ingram on the question lineage, who may teach the authentic Dharma. Damarato is a lineage teacher in the Thai forest Buddhist tradition, a student of the meditation master Bhikkhu Buddhadasa, and is known for his unique one-on-one -on -one teaching style conducted over Skype. Daniel Ingram is an independent Buddhist author and co-founder of the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, EPRC, a multidisciplinary, multinational alliance of researchers, clinicians, and patrons who share a vision of bringing scientific methods and clinical sensibilities to the study of emergent phenomena. In this episode, Damarato and Daniel offer various definitions of the word lineage and debate the value of lineage authorization as a qualification to teach the Buddhist religion. Damarato recalls his own monastic training in what he calls the noble lineage under teachers such as Ajahn Po and Bhikkhu Buddhadasa, and critiques the lack of authentic lineage in the West. Daniel reflects on the pros and cons of the concept of lineage purity and institutional persecution of the outsider. Damarato and Daniel also consider generational preferences in lineage styles, the roles of religious institutions, and predict the evolution of Buddhism in America. So without further ado, Damarato and Daniel Ingram. Damarato and Daniel Ingram, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, it's great you. to be here. And glad to see you too, Dan. Yeah. Several episodes ago, gosh, some, some months ago now, the two of you had a dialogue here on the podcast, Is There Magic in the Dharma? Is There Magic in the Dharma? And that was uh, extre an extremely popular dialogue, and actually, I think, a tremendous demonstration of uh, agreement, disagreement, and, and conversation. Really amazing. So it's been, I think, all of our... A desire to do another one. And so here we are back again. The topic today will be lineage. Who may teach the authentic Dharma? And we know that there are various approaches to lineage throughout the Buddhist world, from the recognition of realization conveyed by the Inca transmission of Zen, to the transincarnational inheritance of wisdom and wealth and status of the Tulku system, and many, many more. Some see lineage as a golden thread, conveying not only the structure of the teaching, but also its essential result, ensuring the authenticity of the wisdom tradition. Others claim lineage has been used as a means of ensuring institutional stability and hegemony, centralizing authority among gatekeepers and excluding independent voices. Damarato, you yourself are a lineage teacher in the Thai forest tradition, and Daniel operates independent of any institutional lineage context. So today, as we engage in this topic, the format will be as follows. Each speaker will have an opening address, a period of time to lay forth their initial responses to the question lineage, who may teach the authentic Dharma. And from there, we will go into dialogue and conversation on this and various themes. At the end, there'll be an opportunity for each speaker to sum up a two minute summation uh, from each speaker, and then that will be the end of uh, this dialogue. So I just want to say, first of all, Damarato and Daniel, thank you so much for being willing to engage in another conversation here on the Guru Viking podcast. I'm really thrilled and excited. And to begin with, Damarato, lineage, who may teach the authentic Dharma? Actually, I would like to talk about those two topics that you just mentioned. When you're asking one question, you're actually um, doing something like shoving two things together or maybe it's kind of like a sandwich in the sense of asking who may teach the dhamma and what is lineage is the second question and then the third part will be how do you shove those things together to get a sandwich so um <clears throat> let's start with the question of who may teach the dhamma and the answer to that is whoever wants to I mean, that's what society is all about. We go around telling each other the right things and wrong things on a regular basis. And sometimes we flavor that or sprinkle it with a sauce called Buddhism, and then we're a Dhamma teacher. Now, there's a lot of people who actually get into the Dhamma and they begin to live the Dhamma. They begin to practice the Dhamma, not to study it, but when they begin to practice it, we begin to practice that not just sitting in the corner 
with our thumb in our uh, head or in our mouth or something, but we actually practice the Dhamma out in the world. And so we become teachers of the Dhamma by living in the world. So uh, we have to look at this problem of the word teacher in the sense of, is it a teacher who's actually teaching or is it some dude sitting on some high stool for some high price? Because they're different. And so looking at the whole concept of who is a Dhamma teacher means that actually what will happen on occasion is people get really enthusiastic about the Dhamma. But they start going through the noble stages. And, and one of the noble stages is, is when we become completely involved and uh, at least 10% of all the thoughts that we have are thoughts of, of dhammas and suttas and things like this. And we're always looking for uh, information and whatnot. And we begin to live the dhamma. That's an important quality of the sotapan is, is that he's absolutely dedicated to the dhamma on top of that, a big pile of enthusiasm. That enthusiasm is based upon uh, development of the skills of uh, right attitude and also the success of correct practice. And so um, anyone who reaches that stage then is um, qualified to teach the Dhamma uh, out of a historical context, that there is some old historical context that someone should be a sotapan before they start teaching the Dhamma, if they're going to be recognized as a Dhamma teacher, okay? That sometimes it's better to just talk about the Dhamma. Sometimes it's better to just be friends with people and just share the Dhamma and not try to claim that I am an authorized teacher or something like that. Um, and not only that, but one of the things that happened in the West is, is that we try to apply Western standards and Western ways of looking at things to Asia in the sense of looking at lineage the way that you would look at lineage in a particular university department or a particular subject. Uh, and so we look at the lineage in, in the sense of the forefathers. So physicists, they have a lineage. Mathematicians have a lineage. And sometimes the lineages meet and merge and diverge and then merge again. So we have these lineages that are part of natural life. And that in the West, we have the idea that it's out of someone studying in that lineage that you, if you don't have an actual Einstein, then you need an Einstein student. An example of that is in fact Freud, that there are uh, six or seven main students of Freud. And these are the various branches of psychotherapy from, you know, Jung and Adler and Maslow and uh, uh, Reich, uh, Byrne. So all of these various students of Freud then begin to have their own lineage or their own group. So uh, with Alexander Lowen, for instance, he has bioenergetics and Freud, ha uh, excuse me, uh, Byrne has TA. And so the lineage is spread out that way. And that's happened also within the context of Buddhism. Is uh, that, and that in fact, you could expect that to happen, but things were pretty tight for quite a long time. It wasn't until the soap came that things got, um, let us say, almost overwhelming for the teachers. There was too many students and not enough lineage teachers or not enough of nobles to spread around. So what happened was a lot of um, ordinary teachings and ordinary understandings of things were taught as if they were Dhamma. And then uh, a, a, an example of that is um, nekama or uh, renunciation. Renunciation in the sense and the style that's normally used, which is a, a ceremony and vows and big important deals like vows of poverty and vows of silence and uh, 
vows of celibacy and those kind of vows and things like that, the Buddha considers that ordinary. That's not noble. And the reason for it is because people are setting themselves up for failure. But uh, nekama or renunciation has become now a major part of Buddhism. But that's how the Western look at it in the sense of the bhikkhu sangha. But there are also within these groups various threads of lineages that have remained noble. And uh, many of them have taken on various ordinary aspects and call that Buddhism. So you could say that actually Buddhism is very vast. The teachings of the Buddha is quite small. And so when you have um, a particular lineage, whoever joins that lineage is going to learn to fit into that lineage and to abide in that lineage. And a, a major way of looking at it is, is that lineage rubs off. That's the whole point of it, is lineage is when you're in an organization and it rubs off. We have many examples of that that um, Masons, for instance, all the Masons, the young men that join the Masons, they all wind up being very similar in some ways. Another one to look at is alcoholics. Alcoholics associate with alcoholics and people who are not alcoholics who associate with alcoholics may tend to become an alcoholic. But if you join AA and now are association, associating with ex-alcoholics, the likelihood is that you become an ex-alcoholic also. This happens within any group, and this is a major aspect of lineage. So when the lineage is noble, then that means that nobility rubs off. When the lineage is very, very strict in the Vinaya, for instance, the really, really gung-ho on every tiny little rule that the monk has, they have to follow that. And they get into that kind of mentality because there is in the suttas the idea of that we go into purification of the sila or our behavior before we um, practice purification of the mind. And then we practice the purification of the mind. Then we practice the purification of our view. And when we've got that, then we have the knowledge and vision of what is and is not the path. So that purification stage, they say, well, that means that uh, in order to get sila correct, you got to spend 20 years watching every move that you make, which does have some value to it. But that um, kind of flavors the lineage because they're overly strict with behavior. One of the ways that that can happen, by the way, is, is that, and I got to say it this way, Thai people do not have a high opinion of Westerners in the temple. Now, in downtown Bangkok, in the high-rise buildings, Westerners are high-status people. At the embassies, high-status people, et cetera. But in the Wat, generally, Westerners are not considered very high-class people. That it's kind of a chauvinism in the sense of, hmm, We've been Buddhists for hundreds of years, and here you Westerners come in with no knowledge of what we're doing or anything. And so that chauvinism is there. And so Achan Cha decided that what he had to do was to start the lineage so that the Thai people would be completely acceptable to these Western monks because they keep the Vinaya better than the Thai monks do. Not that they're sloppy and trying to catch up, but it is 100% or in the Thai language, Ria Roy. Okay, so that means then that if you join uh, at uh, Wat Pabong or Wat uh, Panana Chat, uh, that that's the style that they practice there. And that is uh, strict behavior. And that strict behavior can actually for the Westerners seem, um, how to say, uh, contradictory or um, what's the word, uh, hypocrisy, right? 
because the monks will out, often ask lay Westerners to do things that the monks can't do because it's against the rules. And the Westerners say, well, if it's against the rules for you to do it, why are you asking me to do it? The answer is because you're not in this set of vows. You're not in this set of renunciation, which is an ordinary thing. And so you can see that ordinariness is an example of hypocrisy. So let's look at a noble sangha that's different than that. That is when, and this, this doesn't happen very often, but it does happen frequently enough. Uh, you couldn't say that every Wat in Thailand has a noble. But what you can say is, is that once a noble, he attracts other nobles around him. And uh, what I saw when I was in India, for instance, uh, <clears throat> Rajneesh and Muktananda and uh, who else? Uh, Satya Sai Baba and Mother, uh, what's her name in Pondicherry? forget her name, uh, and Anna in Goa and many of the others that I had, it was always a one-man show. You had the guru, and then you had all the little us's around, uh, bowing and scraping, and sometimes beginning uh, getting closer in by being a volunteer or whatever like that. But that was the way that it was. I was very surprised and became more surprised. In fact, it dawned on me later. It took a while for me to realize what I had gotten myself into at Wat Soen Mo. When I realized that there, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa is the center, but he's just in a group of very, very high quality, high class people who each one has their own uh, thing going, but that part of what their um, job is is to remain at that level of nobility so that that rubs off on all of the people around them also. Okay, so nobility is that which rubs off as opposed to strict uh, vinya behavior, which is another way. And there's also many different kinds of lineages that have various things. But if the lineage is noble, then it is a crackerjack place to spend your time. So um, as we look at this, we need then, there's a, a whole nother way of uh, looking at that. And that is, is that in, there's also a teacher training system that will happen within each one of the lineages. Uh, but basically what it is, is that if you want uh, a sword, you need to get it really hot and then strike it in the, in the cold water. That's basically how they teach. And in other words, they threw me into the fire or they just threw me in. It was a big surprise. The first time that I had to teach in front of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was a big surprise to me. That's how they do it. And then you have to know that you're going to be able to teach the right thing because you've got all of these people who know the Dhamma so much better than you as in your audience. That this is not just, oh, I'm talking to people that may not know what I'm saying. So when you're teaching Dhamma in front of a whole group of people who really know the Dhamma, you have to know that you know what you're talking about and to have that confidence. You see that, in fact, with mathematics professors when they get all into the same room or in an auditorium. Boy, they get humble with each other. <laughs> okay, so... That'll finish my 15 minutes, and we'll talk about uh, some of this a little more. I'm really in, uh, ready for Dan to come stomp on me. <laughs> well, actually, I, I agree with basically everything you said and would actually then amplify a few points that you made. I apologize for the lack of controversy, but there will be some shortly. Just give me a moment. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, the, the point about nobility, I think, is an excellent one versus ordinary dharma. The, po the point about focusing on uh, ritualistic moral codes, which still can be helpful and beautiful in their own way, but still ordinary dharma, I think that is a very important one because it can simultaneously give people a lot of protection and social clout and also make them really neurotic. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> sometimes not very nice and um, sometimes judgmental of others who aren't, uh, you know, competition, comparison are things that can arise. In well, those my, kinds better of... is be my manager is better than yours. Exactly. In those kinds of contexts. And um, so that that's definitely a thing. Um, and I also appreciated the point about different teachers have kind of having their own styles. So each each person actually becomes a unique flowering of the Dharma in some way, even if there are common themes and threads that move through them. So like all of the Thai forest teachers, they're all different. You know, the, uh, if, if you pick up like, you know, Living Buddhist Masters by Jack Kornfield, like they couldn't look more different. And yet there's a similarity about them as well. It's very interesting. And so that that trying to figure out what is the essential thing is, is it becomes something of a, a fascinating question, and I think an important one, although it gets complicated. And so um, I've been thinking of lineage a lot recently because some questions about my own lineage had come up and what that means. And so I thought I would just sort of speak a little bit about that because people are probably wondering. Um, and I was thinking, I had a long conversation with one of my closest Dharma brothers that I've known for 30 years coming up in the path with and started in the Dharma with, uh, with um, and talking about what does lineage mean? And thinking about of the people who taught me how many of them had lineage and from whom, right? So I've done a lot of retreats and sat with a bunch of teachers and read a whole lot of people's stuff and been inspired by a lot of people's teachings. And um, th their, their range is, in, is extremely wide from Tibetan, Mahayana and Vajrayana to Vedanta, through Sharda and Punjaji and um, Christopher Titmus, who was Thai forest, and then he was kind of Western fusion, and then he got kicked out of his own center that he founded, and yet he still teaches a Dhamma freely that has a lot of you know um, efficacy, and I know and I know helps a lot of people, and so and so it it gets very complicated to bill hamilton who was never formally lineage despite being literally one of the most profound and powerful practitioners i've ever met in my life just in terms of sheer technical chops and ability to convey something powerful he never got formal lineage which is curious because he spent years on retreats with people like upandita and um ukundala and um some of the others in mahasi lineage as well as plenty of other teachers and he never had formal lineage and yet his dhamma was profound and transformative and i found it very effective and and um so and you know i've sat with tibetan teachers and zen teachers all of which had lineage and gained wisdom from them and tried to find the common helpful threads in all of these discourses and um and and more like the you know the list of influences i have on my shelf is extremely large and then it, it comes to the question, like, what, what do we do in, in terms of fusion traditions? What do we do in terms of modern traditions? Nearly all of us in this day and age are hybrids. We're not generally coming from one teacher or one lineage or one tradition, as many people in the past uh, would have come from, although plenty of would have wandered around and studied with other teachers and been exposed to other strains. I mean, Buddhism, since its very beginnings, appears to have been a conversation with lots of different spiritual teachers with rich and robust debates and com you know comparisons of the efficacy of practices and questions. I think the last question the Buddha was asked was, who of these other teachers has realization? Right? Who of these other teachers around um, has the, uh, the Noble Dhamma? And the Buddha gave various answers on this question, but I think one of the ones I find most interesting is wherever you find the Noble Eightfold Path, of right speech, right action, right understanding, right concentration, et cetera, right effort. Um, and the three trainings of, of Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. Um, and so... And I actually find that a lot of places in various forms, uh, you know, or you could, you know, sometimes I think, where do you find the three characteristics, which I find liberating? Um, where do you find focus on immediate experience as it is? There are actually a reasonable number of places you can find this. And then, so I think about like, where does the Dhamma come from? Is the Dhamma something proprietary of a specific lineage or a specific tradition or even a specific, you know, branch of a specific twig of a specific broad, complicated lineage system? Or is it something intrinsic that is in experience, that is in reality that we can realize here and now as we look at our own experience? Um, that's how I've always looked at it and looked at all of these as possible pointers that point it back to this fathom long body 
where we can find impermanence, suffering, things changing on their own, causality. These are immediately apparent on inspection and just become more so if we pay attention. That would seem the Dhamma to me. Um, the Dhamma of being hopefully kind and reasonable and decent people when we can remember to be, that would seem the Dhamma to me. And it's and yet the juxtaposition between that sort of a mentality and the mentality of my proprietary orthodoxy is, is the only true lineage, or we are the gatekeepers, as you mentioned, Steve, who can say who is a true teacher and who is not a true teacher based on our judgments. Um, and... Uh, that that mentality is obviously extremely different and has that ordinary quality to it, has that worldly quality to it of power, of comparison, of judgment, of, of exclusivity, of the Dhamma is just for us and not for you, the Dhamma is just of us and not of them, um, where that, that kind of mentality, I think, rapidly um, becomes less aesthetically pleasing to me and I, I, I think less effective. Um, though it is true that some people can be very, very inspired by the notion of a socially designated lineage, and that can inspire good practice, that this is a true teacher who was authorized by this teacher, authorized by that teacher already, all the way back to the, the sanctified Buddha. And there is a beauty in that, and, and I can appreciate that. I, I can, and the faith that it inspires, and faith can be extremely powerful. Um, and help cut through a lot of hindrances and help people be with their experience with confidence. And so, so I understand why the gatekeepers defend so vehemently some of their, their um, claims to be able to, to gatekeep. And, and I, I get why. It's, it's not coming out of nothing. And it's, it's not like they don't have a point of view that has some efficacious validity. Um, and, and their notion that the Dhamma might become corrupt, it's mentioned in the text, the Dhamma can become corrupted. And you even see that in the Buddha's lifetime, where he said people were attempting to corrupt the Dhamma and not teaching things the proper order, the proper way, the proper time, the proper words, the proper emphases, the proper understandings. This, so it, since the very beginning, there has been this, this strong emphasis on, on keeping it true to some sense of an authentic authoritative something. So, uh, so I get why it's there. Um, um, but, but then it becomes super complicated. And so like, if, is the Dhamma actually and lineage, um, is it just from the change of lineage experience? So if you look in the old text, you'll find a stage um, called change of lineage, where one goes from not being a noble one to being a noble one in the using very strict Buddhist parlance of designation of this, um, which is also itself kind of interesting. Um, and then, um, you know, is that the thing that gives lineage? Because in the text, it would say, if you understood these characteristics of your own experience sufficiently to cross over, to have reality synchronize, disappear, reappear, do these kinds of things, and then have a permanent transformation of consciousness, that would seem to be the designation of lineage that that I know people who have actually had that experience outside of formal Dhamma teachings. I've met a few people who on their own realized this simply by paying attention. Um, and then are they lineage? Do they have any hope of lineage if they don't go through all the social hoops? Um, it gets very complicated, lineage in the social designation sense. Um, some of the wisest people I've, no I've known and, and studied with whose presence and, and their simple energy and their life example was so humbling and so inspiring and just so incredible. You could feel it. I mean, you, could, you can feel it when you're around it, right? You can, you can sense this sense of uh, noble presence, of, of giving, of kindness, of generosity, of freely giving of themselves, of appreciation of causality, of appreciation of, of karma, of appreciation of um, a, a life well lived and, and properly comprehended and appreciated. And plenty of these people, some of them were just ordinary villagers, and yet they had this, this quality of, of wisdom and deep living by the example, which is another one of your points I wanted to reiterate. And, and so what is that? Like, is, is that really the Dhamma? Well, again, if it's the Dhamma that is, that is visible to us here and now and transformative and can help our lives have less suffering, really, you know, if the Buddha said, I teach suffering and the end of suffering, then it would seem in some ways anything that reduced suffering had the aspect of Dhamma to it. And so, and then it's just a question of the depth and the degree and the layers and the aspects of suffering that can be reduced 
by those things, right? If that is the essence of the Dhamma, then there's a lot of Dhamma around. There's a lot of kind people in this world who demonstrate how to be noble in terms of how to treat each other with respect, right? There's a lot of Dhamma. There's a lot of people who can teach people to concentrate. And I know plenty of people who have gotten into what I would think of as insight experiences, where the three characteristics became very obvious to them in all kinds of activities, plenty of which had to do with meditative practice, but some of which didn't, because some of this is just obvious, apparent to those who have good eyes to see, like color is to a person with um, good eyesight. And so back to my own question of lineage, just to sort of raise that one, um, I've had various odd relationships to it. I've had people who say, well, your claim of lineage is ridiculous and um, and your claim of lineage is untrue. And other people who think, oh, of course, your claims of lineage are valid, whatever that means. And so you get the eight worldly winds operating where people have lots of opinions on these things. But I can definitely feel in my own life and for myself, like the teachings of all of these people that were kind enough to teach me freely and, and not charge and to, to just give away the kind Dhamma to me and the, the nourishing Dhamma to me, it helped. It made a difference. It, you know, the suffering is became lessened through their their wise advice and their skillful pointings and, and their freely offered techniques. And so I'm very, very grateful for that and have tried to pass it on in that same spirit um, out of a gratitude and an appreciation of how this can help the world, which we're all an interconnected part of. And then that's the other funny thing, right? Because the teachings of no self are actually quite profound in some ways that there is no stable self in the center of any of this. This is an all an interdependent thing. And so even when we start drawing hard lines about lineage, we have to be careful because this is an interdependent transient world. And even that kind of way of thinking, you can miss something subtle and important about wisdom, which is just this interdependence. Not that those designations can't have very important relative value, they can. And we can say, this is helpful, this may be not helpful, this maybe seems more true or less true in those kinds of ways. But, but to recognize that, that really in our experience, you can't find a stable self even that is this thing we think of as the, the true stable lineage, you know, seed of permanent state of being in some way. And that said, there are also transformations that at least during a lifetime seem irreversible. Things stop that don't start again processes of confusion of trying to designate a self out of this can be seen through in a way that doesn't restart at various layers of mind, bringing up the question of, you know, according to the text, I think it's actually crossing the rising and passing away. I think in the text somewhere in the Buddhist text says is the minimum criteria to teach the Dhamma, um, because then one is at least seen in permanence directly for oneself, seen no self, seen things move through. And then, you know, some traditions would say it's, it's stream entry, Right, using traditional path terms coming out of a proprietary system of designation of where awakening begins and and is and isn't, right? And then that or second path in the Mahasi system, right? You would have to be at least second path before they would allow you to teach. So you know, um, you know, and and so right, and so uh, you know, versus um, so so that's that's interesting. And then you have the question of of lay versus monastic people and this question of status. Right, social status. Will lay teachers ever, in some ways, have the social status of monastic teachers from a Buddhist point of view? It's something of an absurdity to really contemplate if you've seen the thing in its original forms. Right? There's there's simply no way. And so, so even if they had the wisdom, would they have the lineage in the socially designated sense? Right? It's it's, um, yeah. So so I'll I'll just kind of uh, stop there. But um uh. uh yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there and then we can go on. Great. What are your thoughts? Well, the first thing to, to start talking about is the various definitions of the word lineage. That that's often a problem, you see, that everybody's got their own view of what lineage should be. And when your lineage doesn't fit with my definition of the word lineage, then I choose my definition over yours. And that's yeah. the competition. That's part of it right there is just the definition of the word. Sure. And, uh, and so uh, let's start defining it in various ways. One of the things that we can say then about lineage in the sense of the change of lineage is the change of lineage into the noble mind from the ordinary mind, which means now you look at who your ancestors and uh, and whatnot. 
that normal people, when they talk of lineage and think of lineage, they're talking about the lineage of their family. Who was my grandpa? Who was my great grandpa? Who was my ancestors? Uh, where did my family come from? Were they French Argonauts or did they come with the, uh, uh, were they already here? Uh, were they Spanish? You know, all this kind of stuff, the ancestry. And that that actually is a, a part of the, the, the thing. So when we're talking about change of lineage, we're also talking about change of ancestry. So that we put our minds now on the Dhamma rather than on family. That that's part of the old tradition was to leave the family. But that, that old tradition well predated the Buddha that he left the family long before he was or, uh, enlightened. And that's, a, that's an important thing to look at is the distinctions between what he did before he was enlightened versus what he did afterwards. And so a lot of people don't, don't think to do that. They just say Buddha did this and Buddha did that without understanding that there were two different people there at least. One was the one who, and, and so you can see, though, that the whole idea then of setting up the, the bhikkhu sangha had several aspects to it. One of them was, is to give uh, people, men first, and then anybody, the freedom to stop messing with the ordinary world and get away from it all. That uh, actually... All we really need is kind of room and board. Well, the robe itself is the room when you're out on uh, Tudong, maybe an umbrella or so, or a little hut like this will do fine. And so um, the, uh, the lifestyle is a complete change that when we are living the life of a layman, normally, we're involved with all kinds of worldly activities, going to work and driving the car to here, there, and yon, and getting this done and that done, and kids have sports and they've got school, and we just get all kinds of things to do in the world we like. And the Buddha recommended in one of the sutras, in fact, it's in the Dinga Nikaya number 31, where he says that it's okay for you to remain a layman, but uh, get out of the world anyway. And the easy way for in the old days, and it's still quite easy here in Thailand because almost all the businesses are small family business. And so the, the head dude of that business actually just gives the business to his wife. And he just saying, like for instance, the storefront, and they've got a little uh, store there and he'll sit and, and meet guests, but it's the rest of the family that wait on their customers. And he's got nothing to do. He's just sitting around and having a ball which is a very noble kind of lifestyle that they develop, even if they're laymen following the teaching of the Buddha, is to give all the uh, responsibilities to the wife. And so when they do that, now they can change that lineage from family obligations and whatnot and spend much more time with the monks, even if they haven't ordained. But they're looking out for and... Uh, associating with nobles. And sometimes the nobles then are these laymen that are hanging out in town. And they're probably the highest quality people in that town and everybody knows it. But And that's how it's actually done. If this guy is still money grubbing, then he will not develop that noble quality that uh, Daniel was talking about that is evident when people have it, but is normally has to do with associating with nobles. It's almost like that in the West, uh, Western mentality, they don't have a clue about what is noble, what is enlightened and all of that. We have a very magical idea of what is enlightened. And so we don't have really any examples. And so all of our Buddhism winds up being uh, studies, studying books and things like this to where uh, what we need um, is a practical. If you're going to learn to do an autopsy, you have to stand there with an autopsy doctor while he's cutting that body open 
and you take a look at it and see if you can still stand. <laughs> 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 and so it's a, it's a training that is a noble training. And that's just one of them. But I mean, I did get a training from my Chan Po that could not have come without me living there with them. And that training is, uh, it's not necessary, but it certainly is part of, the, part of the path, part of the journey associating with nobles. That in fact, the Buddha talks about that. You can say then that the whole Dhamma is being friends with people who know how to be friends. And that's where that friendship or that ability to communicate with people and um, uh, have a glorious relationship. And that marvelous relationship is what uh, is available within the noble Sangha but we don't have it's precious little of it here in the West. Now, in fact, it does exist in the West, quite a lot of it. I would say uh, maybe 350 or 400 watts in the United States that do have monks. And the monks in the United States and the West are generally very high quality monks because the Thai, the lay people know what they're looking for when they go shopping for a monk in Asia to bring him to the United States. They don't go for five or 10 year monks. They want 20 and 30 year monks. And they want to see that shine that the, and that glow that, they, the, that is expected of the monks. And so these are the kind of monks then that are in the United States. And what do the Westerners do instead of flocking to these people and associating with these nobles, they're reading books. Hmm. Yeah, frustrating. So, uh. Yes, and so what, what we need to do is to um, uh, kind of as a group of people, start promoting Sangha, start promoting friendship. Let us help each other learn how to be marvelous friends with each other. Rather nice. than talking about your dhamma is better than my dhamma and vice versa. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's interesting when I when I think back on social designations of dhamma. I know people who have been monks and now are not monks. Are they still in the lineage in the same way as when they were monks? Do they suddenly, regardless of their insights, like lose some respect when they deordain? Like it gets I, complicated, you know, and well, I know people. So, for okay, example, you like, answered it. right. It's not yeah. a yes or no. It's complicated. Right. It's very sometimes complicated. It's both, sometimes it's neither. Sometimes yeah. we don't know. Sometimes it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. And it's interesting. So, like, I was hanging out with Christopher Titmus one day in 1999 and went on a walk with him we were talking about teaching the dhamma and he he said i said you know what do you think of how people become dhamma teachers and he said a dhamma teacher is someone who has been asked to lead a retreat solo i was like oh that's interesting it seemed an interesting and semi-arbitrary designation to me but uh it was what he said at the time i'm not sure exactly where it came from my question is who asked well that's a good question and so then like, you know, maybe some... he did. That's the whole point is most people become Dhamma teachers because they're stuck with they, they have to do this retreat because they set it up. Sure. And they wanted to teach it and now oh. they're in it. And so they got to teach it. <laughs> There's that. And then like, you know, nine years later, I had someone who had actually been a monk in Thailand ask me to teach a retreat for them. Actually, two retreats in a row, long ones. And um, so, you know, what does that mean? And then that person maybe later he went shopping in the wrong places in Thailand. Yeah, maybe, um, possibly. And uh, so, you know, and then, yeah, it gets complicated. So I've been asked to teach by a number of people over the years, some of whom were monks, some of whom were not, some of whom were nuns. Uh, and then, like, what does that mean? Is that, is that some kind of designation? Well, not necessarily, right? Because well, it like, speaks more to the thirst. Sure, that is out it there. does the liquid that's being drank. Right, the, and the thirst is real. And so, 
then that's part of the other question of the need for the Dharma is so profound. Where do you draw the line between attempting to make sure that only certain people are allowed to teach or verified or certified versus meeting the tremendous thirst out there for Why knowledge, wisdom, kindness, and the reduction lines? of lines? Why are you drawing lines? Right, exactly. So that's the question then of like drawing these lines. And it's not like I don't understand why people do it. So for example, in medicine, you know, we draw lines between people who have various degrees and certifications. And I understand why we do that, of course. Although it was interesting, like the best cardiothoracic surgeon I ever met was a PA who had been doing it since the 1970s. Um, and so he wasn't a, a full MD. And yet in this place where I trained, whenever they got into trouble, they'd be like, hey man, come here. And, uh, and he'd come over and, he'd, and they were like, thanks. <laughs> You know, and everybody knew he had the hands that were the hands you wanted on somebody's heart in an emergency, but he didn't have the formal designation. He just had the capability and everyone was certain he, you know, there was no question. Um, even the senior surgeons would do this. It was really interesting because they knew he just had the talent. And so it gets, it gets very complicated. And, you know, like among the world of nurses and doctors, there are these tremendous ranges of, of capabilities. And in the same way in the Dhamma world, and, um, and then I think it very much comes to questions of aesthetics. You know, people have very, very strong aesthetic ideals about how the Dhamma should be, how it should be presented, how it should be spoken, with what language, in what costume, with what background, in what setting, with, with you know, Pali versus Sanskrit, you know, or whatever, the, versus, you know, whatever language versus Japanese versus whatever. People have their aesthetics of, of how they think this should be. And I think a lot of people, at the times people confuse aesthetics and lineage, right? This gets confused all the time and they can't tell, which is you don't meet my aesthetics in terms of the way you speak or, or talk or look or smell or whatever. <laughs> and uh, the, or even necessarily the way people behave. Um, so like there are these stories of like people studying with, you know, uh, Thai masters and then they would later see them throwing rocks at dogs to scare them away from the temple or something and go, oh, they can't be a real master. They threw a rock at a dog. And not that throwing a rock at a dog is nice. It obviously isn't, but it gets complicated. And then that also brings up the three trainings, right? So I've known people who are very good at some of the trainings, but not that good at other ones, right? So like they may have had certain things, certain aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path using that sort of designation for it, that they might have been very highly accomplished in and not as highly accomplished in others. So that's the other thing is, is a lot of people have have parts and pieces of the thing, right? That they may be good at. And then should you not let them teach those parts and pieces because they might not have other parts and pieces? This gets complicated, right? Because um, some parts and pieces they may teach extremely well and others maybe not so much. And people often assume that one will totally inform the others, that if you can concentrate, you'll be a nice person, or that if you can dissolve your body into vibrations, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll make a good, you know, way in the world. We try to do that when it's already dissolved in the vibrations. All we well, have to see, do is see that. Well, there you go. That's sir. And that's the, the, the visibility of the Dhamma here and now. There are two different suttas where the Buddha points out a dog as a teacher, I have two master Dhamma teachers here on the porch. Both of them have ticks, but they don't have fleas. Nice. And um, on, in one of the sutras, uh, the dog could not settle down. He would, he would circle around a little thing, and then he would lay there in his nest. And then he would lay for a short time, and then he would start to bite. And then he'd get up, and he would walk around, and he would circle around that place. And then he would lay back down in, in his uh, uh, hole. And then he would get up again, and he would walk around. And he kept doing that. And the, it was over. Buddha saw that. And he pointed this out and says, look at what this dog is doing in order to understand your own mind. that we will settle down, but we won't stay long. We'll start nipping and biting at something. Next thing you know, we're around in a circle looking for a comfortable place to sit. Then we lay back down in the same place that we were before. And yeah. then we get restless again, and then we start running around, and then we lay back down. And we could just lay there like these dogs. They know how to lay down. These are nobles. <laughs> They're just laying there. So this is one way. 
The other story, by the way, is the, uh, the dog that came to a point where he wanted to jump across the ravine. But instead of doing it, he backed off, he went back, he looked, he looked up and down, he looked back and forth, and then he went back, and then it ran, and it just took it, and it just jumped right across. And the Buddha says, that's Dhamma practice. You got to look at what you're doing, but then when you are sure, you got to do it. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Christopher these are Titmus. both, by the way, in the, in the uh, uh, Sutta Napata. They're, these are some of the old teachings. Nice. And um, yeah, there's a story Christopher Titmus liked to tell about a, a kid who would be, who was just one of kids who lived in the monastery, young teenager, and um, he would be sweeping up and playing with the chickens and just doing little tasks around. And occasionally the monk would get him up on the front cushion. And when he sat up on the front cushion, he would expound profound transformative Dhamma that demonstrated clear and, and obvious understanding to everyone who heard it. And then he would get back down and go back to sweeping up the, the sidewalks and playing with the chickens and stuff. And not a monk, just a, a, an ordinary layperson who had an ability to speak wisely on the, the self-evident truths of experience. Or, um, or maybe he was just an ordinary kid until the monk put him on the spot and then he shined. Don't know. Maybe that. Well, that's part of the lineage stuff that is there. Is is that monks and and whatnot are put on the spot. You got to be ready for it. Uh, <laughs> Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa and Ajahn Po played tricks on people. Ha! Huh. Nice. One of them I remember, well, the easy one to remember, in fact, there were several things that, ha that happened. I could go on and on about Achan Po's teaching style. Uh, but he would just show up at the cootie and wait for me, wouldn't call, wouldn't let me know, just stand there just to see how long it took me to realize that he was there or that I had to, you know, take a look. And I got pretty good at that. Because he did this four, five, six times until he recognized that he can't do this anymore because I'm going to be there when he <laughs> for him when he comes. And so these are the kind of tricks that they play hmm. uh, uh, as for wake up. Another yeah. one which I remember quite a, a lot was is that uh, even though uh, on Bendabot go barefoot, normally uh, the monks find easy paths to take. When Bhikkhu, uh, when Achan Po took me and a couple of other new monks, he took us on a, uh, what, a field trip. I remember one road that had especially large gravel, and he would always walk across that, and we had to follow him. So this is the kind of training. Okay, this is a noble kind of training. Can you do this? Can you hmm. watch where you're going? Other would own that Bendabot would be um, a, a, an area that tended to be muddy. How are you going to handle this muddy area, especially if it's muddy on a hill? And hmm. the other one was um, the way that you carry the bowl. See, when you're out on Bendabot, you don't take the bowl bag, or if you do, the bowl bag is used for extra stuff, but you've got to hold the bowl with the hand and then manipulate it with the, with the left hand while you've got that, what they call elephant truck, so that you open the bowl. And now he adds an umbrella. So you've got to manipulate an umbrella and keep the robe on and open the bowl with, uh, with the lid and mandate everything like that and not drop your food. So um, this is the kind of stuff that is, um, part of the lineage training that you just wouldn't think of anyplace else. Huh. And then the question is, what is the relationship with that, between that and authentic lineage? Would you have needed those specific experiences to be part well, of the lineage? Maybe I don't think that many people got the exact same experiences as I sure. did. Right. But I do know that they were there giving me experiences. Nice. And, and that that yeah. was part of it that I never got from Goenka. As long as I stayed with Goenka, I didn't get any kind of that kind of one-on-one -on -one training with him. 
Well, it's a curious thing about the Goenka lineage is Goenka is the teacher and everybody else is an assistant teacher by designation. So it's, and it's yet a curious thing. Nobody can teach because they all do it by video. Right. And so it's a curious thing where it, it's some, in some ways it's a lineage, in some ways it seems like an end of a lineage. It's, it's odd. Um, interesting system there. I hope it works well. Um, and then this. It will if someone breaks out. Someone will have to break out of the mold and start saying that we're doing authentic Goenka trainings, but we're not going to play authentic Goenka tapes. Hmm. It's complicated. I think the Sangha is split over these kinds of questions, actually, with one part that really likes the, the sense of a permanent, stable thing and one that um, wants more innovation. But that's always been the history of Buddhism, as Buddhism has always had right. these things where people coming attempted... out of the ordinary yep. clinging to the past and wanting things to be this way and that way and going into the noble anicca vata sankara upata vaya domino you know everything is flux everything is in change let's stay with the times we recognize that things got to stay up so we keep up with it so this mm. is this is the difference that yeah and by and large you would say that the ordinary people, those of ordinary right view, are in the majority, the vast majority. Hmm. The nobles are rare. And it's even more rare when there's no one around to have it rub off. You were lucky to get it. You could have spent all the time and did all the things that you did do and still be unhappy and miserable. That is Something true. Something changed. I know plenty that that is true for years and years of retreat, and yet some transformation on a few relative levels, but not much. It's uh, yeah, it's so interesting to ponder why that happens, cause what aspects of causality make that um, be the case. I wanted to come back to a point of it family, has to actually. Do with association. Yeah, if likely. You're associating with people who know how to live happily, then you learn how to live happily from them, and other people read books. Nice. And they don't find how to be happy in a book. There you go. This is a Buddhist joke book. <laughs> well, that's the other interesting thing is, um, hmm, yeah, who you associate with. I mean, lineage in a lot of ways, you were mentioning lineage is basically modeling on the, the concept of family. And in a lot of ways, it is a family. And everything in a lineage can happen that happens in a family where some people in lineage like each other, some people in lineage don't. Some people in the lineage break with the lineage. Some people in the lineage get what they feel like is unfair treatment. Like uh, in the Mahasi tradition, apparently when Saito Upandita was given the um, a lot of the monasteries and responsibility because he had the administrative skills, apparently there were other monk practitioners who were like, wait a second, we're, we're better practitioners than this guy, but they may not have had the administrative ability. And so... Like apparently there was some rumble in the background, subtle, like, hey, wait a second, you know, who, who, what, how is this going down like this? You know, and so this gets complicated, right? I find right? that so amazing. May I make a comment about it? <laughs> you may, but I just wanted to finish my point that like okay. anything you can imagine happening in a family is also what happens in a lineage. And, and so I think part of the other sense of the, 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 the lines that people draw or people have a sense of like, I want to be in a clean family, a pure family, a true family. And that same kind of spirit of like pure blood or pure purity for the sake of kind of purity of an authenticity of an authority that says this is super clean and this isn't that same kind of mentality we see in politics or drawing borders or against other groups. We can see it applied within the Dhamma and questions of orthodox and lineage and family, because some people do not want the sense of taint or, you know, with aesthetics or qualities or whatever that are, oh, that's not my lineage. And, and then if it's not my lineage, because my lineage is the true lineage, then that's not lineage, right? So some people can get very much like that with that same kind of spirit, which I think has the same kind of problems. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at it then from the perspective of that um, there are many different lineages and some of them are family. We talked about uh, early about 
change of lineage in the sense of, and many people will actually change their lineage by changing from their actual ordinary birth family with blood and all of that into a, a religious lineage of whatever description, Buddhist or whatever, but it's still ordinary lineage. It's still ordinary. It's not noble yet or at all. However, when the, when the lineage becomes noble, part of that has to do with crossing lineage. And it, like we talked about before, it takes one to know one. And uh, several of that would be that um, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was quite well known throughout Thailand with many, many abbots of many uh, wants that you wouldn't think. In fact, he had a very close relationship with Achan Panyananda, who was the head abbot of the largest wat in Thailand, probably in the world, hmm. with some, several thousand monks, okay? And they were best friends. In fact, I found out about Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa by meeting a monk from Wat Chulapatan in uh, Bodh Gaya. So um, the, the, the point, though, to make is, is that there's other connections that you might find surprising. Uh, the Dalai Lama has actually gone to visit Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa in Thailand to share that lineage, that both of them consider each other noble. And not only that, but uh, the Dalai Lama planned a second one, but then the Chinese government stepped in and told the Thai government, don't give this guy a visa or we're going to be messy with you. And so he didn't come the second time. But the mm. only reason for him to come to Thailand was to go visit Bhikkhu Buddha. He had no political interest at all. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is also uh, uh, been a fan of Bhikkhu Buddha. Dasa. So that lineage idea uh, transcends the ordinary lineage, uh, lineages and the bickering that you're talking about that ha happens within an, within an ordinary lineage so that there is a noble lineage and the noble lineage is that which allows differences of dress and costumes and, and uh, um, teachings and all that kind of stuff but they still have that quality of brotherhood, that quality of noble friends that's what we're looking for and uh that needs to be established in the west because we don't have that most of the teachers whatever they're teaching we can't say that this is a good teacher or a bad teacher but what we can say is almost all the teachers are competing with each other over who is good and who is bad a lot of which comes down to questions of money and power and uh, authority and students and and all of that, yeah, which is very worldly, name and, obviously. Name and fame and fortune, precisely. Right. Yeah. Which is just ordinary stuff. Right. It's not noble. When these guys get noble, then they behave nobly and are uh, above name and fame and fortune and uh, all of that stuff and competition for students. And so uh, we can, and by the way, that money issue is something that we have also talked about is getting the money out of it. But really the intention of getting the money out is so that we can allow a noble Sangha to grow because a Sangha is not going to grow out of the mud of money grubbing. Yeah. Because it's got competition built into it. So this is what I would say to promote is let's all become friends and, and uh, have Sangha so that we can um, promote uh, generosity and welfare and also guide students into finding noble teachers that are available to them rather than paying huge amount of money for, for people who want a lineage and all they get is money instead. So we can build lineage. It doesn't matter where your past came from. If we can get into a noble collection of friends, that's the lineage. We can call it the Western lineage. Yeah, and that also brings up the question of Kalyana, you know, Mita or, you know, spiritual friends, noble friends versus strict sort of student teacher hierarchies, right? Because mm -hmm. interestingly enough, 
after my initial phase where I was sitting with a bunch of teachers that were on the front cushion, basically nearly all of my Dharma practice just involved friends who found each other, who liked to practice together, who helped each other on the path, who read, studied, explored, looked into their own experience to see what was true. I thought you told me you didn't have a lineage and here you are describing it in detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's the thing, right? So this, it's this loose association. That, and I, like, I have people, I just send people to them like, oh no, you, you should go talk to this person. You should talk to this, this person would be a great fit for you. They're, they're, they're a kind, thoughtful person. And that, that's just, it's, it's a, it's an informal network and we just help each other out. And it's, that's, that's what I've felt most comfortable with. And it's interesting, like I've had people who have offered me lineage transmission. Um, oh, and ceremony. It lies in ceremonies, to, right? Right. Yeah, that's rituals. a ceremony, right. That's an ordinary kind of thing to do. You might have fun doing it, but it's an ordinary thing. I mean, you're not going to sure. pop out being enlightened all of a sudden because right. you have a ceremony. Yeah, and, and formal designations. And I've had people ask me to do the same for them. Um, and And... It, it seems to miss the core point of of like what to me, and again, we all have our sort of aesthetic appreciation of what the essence of the Dhamma is. The essence of the Dhamma is something that you can see for yourself, that is self-evident, that helps, that that makes a difference, that you can demonstrate makes a difference in your own experience. Um, empirical in both senses of the word as an experiment, something you can verify and something you find in your own experience, practical, effective, um, and, and I think where you find that, you find something of the light of this thing. And so that is very much more the spirit that I live in these days and appreciate more because the social stuff just gets endlessly petty and complicated and designative and all of that stuff. Whereas the, to me, what I think perhaps, you know, biasly is the real thing is what you find in the fathom long body by reflection, by contemplation, by investigation, and seeing what makes the difference here and now. So, um, yeah. And then the people who have helped you to do that well in a way that is transformative, that's the really the key point, regardless of what you call it. Um, <laughs> Steve, I would actually be interested in your opinions on some of this, because I'm sure this is a question this is, that has come up All for right. you, and you've been very politely quiet, but I would love to hear <laughs> what your take on this is from your own experience and your own experience okay. of lineage. Is that All something right. you're willing to talk about? Mm -hmm. Could I uh, interject something perhaps to throw a different counterpoint in? You're agreeing, I think. Both of you are agreeing on a lot of points. And so let me, uh, for the sake of uh, argument, disagree <laughs> in some way anyway. So we're talking about lineage as uh, family, thinking of this family uh, model and family, both in the sense of uh, genetic uh, lineage, uh, my son, uh, my son's son, my son's son's son, etc. in sort of patrilineal sense. Which you uh, see, see actually sometimes in the Dhamma. Indeed. You know, like in the, in the traditions. There is that, there, there is that idea. And of course, we see that in the animal kingdom as well, a tremendous um, keenness on the veracity uh, of of the genetic lineage um, going forward. It's a, you could say um, an evolutionary drive, perhaps, if we were to take that view. But you're also using family in the sense of group or tribe, which is a slightly different way of thinking about family. Uh, another angle on it, perhaps, is the angle of social proof. That human beings, it seems, have to find some way of evaluating each other uh, on many different uh, means, even the trustworthiness of another person is to some way moderated by their reputation. We can determine whether someone's trustworthy or not in a community, for example, based somewhat on their reputation. Of course, it's not a, it's not a hundred percent guarantee. So we could say that it's similar for a knowledge base, such as uh, religious uh, wisdom tradition, or as you, you talked about the medical tradition also, you used that idea that lineage in that sense or authentic authentication or um, formalized recognition of institutional bodies could be seen as a sort of uh, outgrowth of this um, social proof uh, uh, effect or this social proof dynamic. Well, why don't we all get together and uh, recognize who we think uh, are the people who know what they're doing, uh, something like that. And then eventually that becomes so some sort of a school. 
or some sort of a lineage. And lineage is not, in that sense, only to do with verification. It's not simply, one doesn't simply qualify as a heart surgeon so that you can have all the perks of being a heart surgeon. That, of course, is part of it, and that's part of the attraction. But also there's a sense of pooling of knowledge of um, you're going to qualify as a heart surgeon from a, a good school uh, because you want uh, to have access to and be a practitioner of that good knowledge. And w what use is that? Well, then when you do heart surgery, presumably it will uh, be more effective. So in discussing the medical, we say, well, generally speaking, a heart surgeon qualified from a good school is going to be better than, than someone who just has this kind of a talent, if you want, or maybe some sort of knack, um, autodidactic knack for heart surgery, for example. We can generally say that. Can we find exceptions to that? Like the PA you mentioned, sure. We can find exceptions of that as someone who's very, very talented and very skilled um, without the official uh, authentication. Does that exception uh, prove the rule? Perhaps it does. Similarly, we can find heart surgeon who, despite passing, <laughs> perhaps, uh, yep. are, you know, of the, all those that pass as qualify as heart surgeons, you've got the, 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 the top of the class and you've got you've got the guy who <laughs> just had a particularly strong cup of coffee that day and managed to scrape by. Those are two very different classes of qualified professional. So even there's uh, also the possibility that the guy who graduated last in class still winds up being a really excellent doctor for one reason or another. For instance, he really knows how to read people very well. Yeah. And the guy so, who's the star of the show in college continues to try to be the star of the show, whatever show he's in, and he winds up being a first class, nobody likes him kind of person. But in taking this, so my final, I suppose, point on it is in taking this dialectical approach of, of saying, well, uh, lineage or authentication or certification, if you like, um, is there to ensure uh, generally a certain sort of a quality and then saying, well, can't we think of it? Isn't it possible that somebody wouldn't have that qualification and would have that quality? Yes. Or wouldn't it be possible that someone has that certification, but is actually quite low quality? Yes, that uh, almost Hegelian dialectical approach, um, uh, in a certain sense, you could be seen to deconstruct the category, to construct the idea of certification. But on the other hand, perhaps it's uh, more sophistry in that sense. Are we in danger of, um, in, in just pointing to exceptions, uh, erasing the very real uh, reasons that lineage comes up in the first place, which is to say, hang on a minute, there's somebody over there claiming to be a heart surgeon and they're hurting people. Why don't we form a body, uh, some sort of group of people that we all think are good heart surgeons? Now, the question, of course, comes or the danger could, could come when that group decides now let's let's form an army. Let's form a militia and we'll seek out all of those heretical heart surgeons, the ones that are not doing it correctly and perhaps with the best of intentions, form some sort of uh, rounding up uh, of these uh, non-authorized heart surgeons and some sort of perhaps mass execution. <laughs> have we not seen this in the very religion that you're discussing uh, uh, in the Absolutely. past? Absolutely. We have. So there are these complexities, but nonetheless, um, are in this sort of dialectical style that you're engaging in, um, is there something we're missing here? Yes. One of the things that you're missing here is, is that may, perhaps we can go this direction that all of those heart surgeons, in order to be qualified, must stand on stage and do heart surgery on themselves while everybody's watching with a lot of cameras. And when he does a really good job of, of um, uh, doing his own heart surgery, now he's qualified to do heart surgery on other people. You can hear the Dhamma in that. I mean, it's a joke to think about medical doctors <laughs> doing it. <laughs> but we're heart doctors too, thank you very much. And if we cannot do our own heart surgery, how can we possibly be able to do it with, with others? And so that's the real manage then, is, is being around those who have been skillful enough to do their own heart surgery so that they are skilled enough to do a bit of heart surgery on you too. And that um, going back to that 
one of the points that I was thinking about, the Buddha talked about this in the way that people ask him, well, why do you teach? And his answer to that was, is I teach for the welfare and the benefit of future generations. Well, there you go. That's that uh, instinct of perpetuation of the species writ large in the Dhamma, that that's the reason that the Buddha taught was not for the men around him at that particular time, but he taught it for future generations, knowing that this transmission from one individual to the next to the next, just like seeds in um, uh, human sex give prodigies or give um, uh, the new generation, so too that's with the Dhamma. And so uh, that's part of the expectation is, is that we are trained with good teachers. Going back to one of the qualifications, Achan Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa had the idea that one need only be proficient in the teachings of Paticca Samuppada, which in a way would be another way of just saying that he's got the triple gem or that he's got the uh, trilokana or whatever like that. But th he's got the knowledge that can be then transmitted he's got the correct knowledge that can be transmitted directly if all he's got to transmit is knowledge if he is noble though then he will have also not just the knowledge but the spark that goes with it and often the spark is better than giving the student a bunch of sticks and tell him to go rub which is way the westerners are trying to do it now what they need <laughs> dead is a spark that spark of nobility the spark of being around nobles so that we can get a lineage started because right now people who are rubbing two sticks together over a long period of time basically it takes too long i mean it really does not take long if you are around nobles watching every move and every step and every thought that you take because your own display is as you see um, this is true, by the way, if you join a Sangha, if you want to, don't want to call it a Sangha, but let's say you, you join a, uh, a mob, that you belong to the Mafia. There, when you're in the Mafia, you're expected to behave in certain ways. And if you deviate from that, there's going to be trouble. Well, there's kind of like that also, except that it has to do with exactly turning everything around in the sense of, um, these guys are friends and they're friendly with you. Why are you trying to compete with them or trying to divide them or getting friends with one over another when they're all together? Okay, so this is part of that lineage thing when, the, when it's noble, we're expected to act nobly and to behave nobly and to think nobly and then to feel noble and then to know that you're noble. This is part of the practice that has um, that noble quality to it that is possible for someone to get on their own, but it's also possible for them to get all of the sticks and twigs and all of that out of a book, but then they still have to go rub rather than the transmission. Uh, a good example of that is there is a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya in the fives where the Buddha talks about five ways of reaching first jhana. And the fifth one and the last one on the list is the way that everybody does it in the West. And that is out there with their meditation practice and their cushion and their rubbing sticks together in their mind, trying to get a thing going. But the Buddha talks about number one is when a teacher and a student are sitting and talking about the Dhamma, they're talking about noble things they're talking about wholesome things so the mind is naturally of the student inclined towards having wholesome thoughts and is free from hindrances right there in that conversation he's got the basis for first jhana just by paying attention to his teacher and then maybe the teacher will smile or wink or say something and then the joy arises and the satisfaction arises and the student winds right up in first jhana just by having a conversation with his teacher who knows how to do that? 
But it's also quite possible for the teacher himself to wind up in first jhana just by being able to teach the Dhamma and having the thrill of knowing that his transmission to that student is working. And so the, this is actually part of the lineage then that you can see that it's in that communication of the Dhamma that's oftentimes more difficult to do when you're trying to read noble, wholesome things out of a book. Our mind still wanders around because we don't have the, um, the ability to stay focused the way that all three of us are focused on this conversation right now. And I wouldn't be focused on anything for this long for anything else if I were just off piddling something. And so hmm. that, that focus and that quality of staying with the teacher while he is uh, uh, directing the conversation is actually quite possible to place a student in first jhana. I like to do that, by the way. It's one of the tricks that I pull uh, uh, to, to see if I can get the student into first jhana or not while they're in the video. Uh, nice. But I got the inspiration for doing that out of this sutta, that this is what is expected of a good Dhamma teacher is to be able to have the students in first jhana in that conversation. That's part of the rubbing off. So if we take this idea of the social proof as being one, one uh, function of lineage, a formalized social proof, then we can say that if one wants to learn to become a heart surgeon, then going to a recognized institution is... Uh, likely to be a more efficacious way than uh, just, in a certain sense, experimenting by oneself uh, or just try attempting to discover it oneself. We can go to this repository of both knowledge and also uh, teaching ped pedagogy, and we can we can learn to be a heart surgeon that way. So it's good for the heart surgeon. It's also good for those who need heart surgery, because if the heart surgeon is uh, authorized by this body, it doesn't guarantee that they're going to be the best heart surgeon available. Uh, but on aggregate, on the whole, there it's a way of outsourcing the evaluation of his capabilities to um, a third party, which is presumably other experts. Is that open to corruption and nepotism and all sorts of things? Absolutely, it is. And many institutions go through that life cycle of innovation or formation, preservation, uh, stagnation, and then they have a, a choice, usually some sort of innovation or reform, or perhaps even uh, degradation and, and dissolution. There, there's a life cycle there. But surely the answer is not um, to just look around for who seems... The, the problem is that the, the, the seeker, if you like, isn't necessarily in a position to evaluate the uh, effectiveness or the realization or anything else about More the than likely if they get a teacher that they like they've got the wrong teacher <laughs> well <laughs> well i don't that, know if that's necessarily well, true i actually pretty much liked all of my teachers and i thought they were pretty good bill hamilton was a quirky dude but um but still he was likable in his strange way um but so your that, point uh, so go the, ahead. the final sentence is simply this the final sentence is simply to say that if we have if we have lineage we're going to have some in the lineage who are not so good and and if um, there'll be some outside of the lineage who are who are really good but um but nonetheless we can we can put more trust in a lineaged person whether that's a heart surgeon or, or something like that as a whole with the awareness that we still have to evaluate then we can some maverick running around the place or unauthorized or maybe even outright condemned by that institutional body have there been tremendous voices sure. in the past condemned by institutional bodies absolutely wrongly absolutely but on the whole there's it's, one more one thing function. though that there's one more thing though that you're not mentioning which is actually that heart surgeons i don't know anything about heart surgery i'm not a big dude on actual mechanics of cutting things open with scalpels and whatnot but uh one thing that I do know, and that is, is that is often, and they even call it this, a fraternity of heart surgeons. Dan may, in fact, know the, the name of the fraternity of heart surgeons, but in that fraternity of heart surgeons, if a heart surgeon comes across the patient that he's not sure of, that he can do the right job, he knows which heart surgeons, all of them, in fact, and all of them in his city and perhaps the very best ones in the country so that he can send his patient to, to where your average quack who uses a, a French uh, cutting knife or a French cooking uh, knife for his heart surgery, he doesn't have any backup. 
that that's the problem with the charlatans is when they get run out of charlatanism, they don't got nothing to where if you've got lineage, you've got backup. Yeah, that, that's an that, important and interesting point. I, I think, Steve, to, to address some of your points, I think that you make you make a lot of good points, and I think your arguments have a lot of validity, and they also help some other complicated social aesthetic problems. One of which is if you if you have an institution that says you have an MD, you don't have to say you have an MD, even though you generally put it on your shirt and then introduce yourself as Doctor So and So or you know PA So and So or Nurse So and So, whatever you know um, body is certifying you as being whatever you are, etc. Tech So and So, um, uh, then. In that same kind of way, um, it avoids the complicated problem in Buddhism where do you say you have realization? To say one is a noble one, to say one has realization is very politically complicated. There are monastic rules against it, except between monks and nuns. There are sort of general taboos. There's the counter example of people back in the day that routinely seemed to state various attainments or were declared by others to have various attainments, which is perhaps less socially awkward, but potentially more or less accurate, depending on how good you, you know, how easily we think we can read others with what degree of accuracy in terms of their attainments, which obviously is very political and, and very complicated. And so so the, the Here's institutional normally the way to keep that complicated out. Go ahead, but there's a way of taking that complication out. Go ahead. What are your thoughts? Well, if you have attained something, there's only one person that you should share it with, and that is your teacher. That is the one that you trust that knows you as well as you know yourself, or perhaps better. And that if we tell somebody that we're not quite sure of, then we go ask somebody else and we can go around, you know, that way. Uh, but if you have uh, that lineage to where you really have ultimate trust in your teacher, going to him and telling him that you've got some attainment, that's got I mean, that's a big deal for most people to, to do that. And we want to be really ready. We want to be really sure. We want to be able to answer whatever questions that the teacher has and all of that kind of stuff. And we also want confirmation that we do not want disappointment. That we're talking about now is something that's even a bigger deal than most young men going up to a girl to ask her for a date. We do not want to be disappointed. I would rather not ever meet that girl than to have her turn me down. That's also the issue with the teacher. You do not want to go to Bhikkhu Buddhadasa or Aichan Po and say, hey, man, I made it, just to see his reaction. Because that's, you know, we're, that's off in dangerous territory. But once one gets by that point, I don't see much use of talking about it to anybody else. Because as Dan was talking about it, it's dangerous. Well, it's complicated, and there are pros and cons to it. As someone who's done the experiment, you get to get to see all the the, the count that you get to see for your own uh, in one's own life, the reactions that arise from those kinds of things, and they are obviously a mix. And the, this is complicated. So some people find it very offensive. Some people find it very inspiring. Some people find it very confusing. Some people uh, come find it uh, something to compete with. Some people um, find a lot of judgment in it. Some people then find themselves becoming very judgmental. Some people then themselves are inspired that they might themselves might be able to attain to realization. And so it, it's a very it's a very double-edged sword. And, and so and again, fitting with various people's aesthetics and understandings of karma is complicated. And so, but the question of an institution that could then do that for you to give you a hat or a title or a designation or a temple or whatever they give you, a special robe, a special name, those kinds of things, um, they in some ways diffuse it out. But then the problem with that diffusion is all the problems of inaccuracy and politics, because it is. it also seems to be true that a lot of the people that rise to the top of power structures often seem to have certain personality styles that are conducive to rising to the top of power structures. 
Right. And so, <laughs> you know, because right. that's what their personality style is seemingly well geared for. And then you get these people controlling the designations of lineage, which then often has all the problems one might imagine. And so that's been as true in the in the Dhamma sometimes as it has been in corporations or or governments. And so we can look at the history of plenty of nations that have had the Dhamma with them for a while, and you can see all the the battles for power, the conflicts, the this you know lineage of monks going against that lineage of monks, you know, vying for control of the government and vying for you know patronage of wealthy patrons and merchants, and and vying for whose Dhamma will be recognized by the court or the king or whoever it is. Um, and so, so we see all of that in the world swirled up in institutions. And so what we're left with is the realm of samsara, in which things are imperfect, in which there is suffering, in which there are the eight worldly winds, in which there is uncertainty. In, in, and then the question is for ourselves, I actually like the Buddha's last words, as you said earlier, can we be a light unto ourselves and see what for ourselves when we follow it? when we practice it, when we do it in this own fathom long body, leads to a reduction in our own suffering, an increase in our own happiness, um, and, and seems to accord with our own experience um, and holds up well in the face of a lot of change. And, and so that, I think, is the more interesting thing. But again, I can see why people still desperately want the, the social designations, the perfect institutions, the proper designations, the trustable verifications, and all of that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in 25 year, 2,500 years, at least, of the Buddha Dhamma and going back to those who had wisdom before, um, we have not yet found the perfect stable thing that always does this well. And so that's the world we live in, <laughs> run by the demon Mara, if you want to get all mythological or practical about it, depending on how you look at it. Anyway, so not a surprise. Um, Steve, you were nodding there. Did you have thoughts? Oh, I think I've put my oar in. I've thrown a bit of a trying to throw a bit of a spanner in the works or a bit of a contradictory opinion which is uh which I've, I've i've laid out actually so not not really i mean the the problem with the maverick um who refuses to submit to certain uh, institutional restrictions is, is that uh they well, the maverick then must acknowledge i think their perhaps uh, vulnerability to misleading themselves and, and lack of course correction by the by the greater body of um, it, we call them professionals or, or or experts or whatever you want to say. However, the institutionally or, or authorized person, it seems, needs to be aware of their fa the possibility of their fallibility as well. And it's not to say that these are exclusive to these categories, these fallibilities, which is that just because you've got the stamp, uh, it doesn't mean you're doesn't mean you're always right. And uh, the very institution that you might be endorsed by may itself um, uh, be compromised. It inevitably will be, to a certain extent, compromised uh, with some sort of politics, uh, tribalism, protecting of the intellectual fiefdoms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it seems that uh, there's no easy way out. The question could, could be that there seems to need to be a creative tension between the inside and the outside, between the authorized and the unauthorized. Neither of them are perfect. Um, the question is, where do we draw the line? When does institutional power, uh, wielding of that, become a, an abuse of that? And wh when, when is the maverick's uh, refusal to participate in that main, main body, uh, uh, should we say? Uh, and then it even depends on what you mean by main body, because there are so many possible main bodies. Indeed. So, for example, like I got invited to an international Dharma teachers gathering um, some years ago uh, by Shenzhen Young, and there were hundreds of us there, and uh, it happened at Omega Institute, and it was a delightful, incredibly multi-cultural, uh, uh, very diverse gathering of people from so many lineages and from so many ways and so many traditions and, and so many uh, ways they had come into the Dhamma, uh, so many languages, so many practices, so many outfits. It was fascinating. You know, and then it was interesting. Then the Gen X Dharma gathering, which was happening just shortly thereafter, um, and I think very close by, that a lot of people then went to, said, "Oh, Daniel, you're not a Gen X Dharma teacher." Like, so it was interesting that I met the criteria of the one body and not the other body. 
um, just because of the way they draw their lines. And so it depends on even what, what you is mean. Gen X. Uh, Gen X. It would be people sort of in my general age range. It's it's after the boomers and before the Gen Ys, millennials, etc. So it's a specific date range of people that are after the baby boomers. Um, and so, like, so it's, well, it's very interesting to see acceptable? how. What would be acceptable then to the Gen X? Well, that's. But then this baby is just boomers one. Boomers or millennials, if if they're going to be unacceptable of, I don't understand. I don't. I just. I don't get it. Why well, are you not acceptable? Yeah, it's just of the way age? they the way they drew their criteria, which had to do with you know strict formal lineage transmission in one of the lineages they thought was something, which. Um, oh, and, I and see. so okay. like in a in the ritual ceremony designation social stamp kind of way. And so, and so it was very interesting to see how one generation was flexible and one generation had actually, you know, gone back to something more rigid, perhaps in the face of the sort of loose perennialism of the, the boomers was retracting back into something where they felt for their own comfort needs, they needed something more strict because perhaps they're, and so it's interesting how you see these oscillations socially, culturally, generationally, where some generations may be more or less like the hippies initially were like super wild and whatever, dude. And then a lot of them in their old age became the gatekeepers, you know, and the institution holders like and that's mm -hmm. part of the natural cycle of life. In some ways, we all start out as rebels and then sometimes become parts of institutions. In some ways, I'm, you know, cre doing my own institutional creation with the EPRC project. Um, and so like, so you, you see these, these trends of like people, even within their lifetime between generations and different, you know, moments in time and moments in history seem to need more or less strictness or have more or less a, of a rebellious or free spirit or more an interest in fusing things together or more an interest in strict purity and old and ancient and, and whatever versus suddenly innovative and cutting edge. And, and all of these are the creative tensions, as you mentioned, a creative dynamic tension and conversation between the mavericks, the outsiders and the insiders of whatever group they're inside of, right? That That is also the evolving, changing nature of this world and of culture. And it's interesting, everyone like thinks of like the 60s as like the sexual revolution. When it turns out, I think back in the 20s and 30s, people on average had more sexual partners. Like, you know, if you just look up the numbers on this and and there, there are all these strange things where people sort of lose the historical perspective on the on the great large cycles that that people sort of swing through in life and history and time and everyone's sort of captivated by their own moment right not recognizing the bigger dynamics of change and bigger swirling ocean currents and tides that mm -hmm. that we all live within so just to, to lend something of that grander meta perspective to this conversation. And then just remembering that in a hundred years, all of this will be forgotten. Nobody will know the vast majority of our names and we will be dust. <laughs> and all of our, our things that we thought were so super important, maybe we were missing some of the key points. Um, anyway, so just to, to add those kinds of, of takes on the thing. There's something very interesting about what you were talking about in the sense that uh, specifically within Western Buddhism is that we're it's going through evolutionary changes and making those changes because people are not satisfied with the way things are. And they seem to have only a tunnel vision of possibilities and so this samsara cycle is almost like they're disappointed with it the way that it is now so let's try this they're disappointed with that and so they try this they're disappointed with that and so they try this and then they're disappointed with that and so they try this and they're back where they've started and that's the cycle that you're seeing of sometimes they want lineage sometimes they don't Sometimes they want this kind of lineage and sometimes they want freedom from all kinds of lineage, right. like the hippie movement and, and whatnot like that. And it's very interesting that life cycles also have to do then with the age of the people that the hippie movement, by the way, part of what happened in the 1960s had to do with um, medical revolutions, most specifically birth control pills and 
freedom of abortions. And that is what happened that really opened Pandora's box. But now people are recognizing that even though we got freedom because we had now a new kind of medical safety, that still didn't solve all the problems of sexuality. And so we kind of closed back in again. This is the natural cycle of things uh, because of events like uh, a change in medicine or um, an example of that is the Dhamma, the, the, what do they call it? The practical Dhamma or um, the Dhamma of the West of um, pragmatic acts, the word for it. Pragmatic, yeah, which I'm often uh, mentioned in, in those kinds of uh, uh, conversations as having had something to do with its, its origins, which is weird considering I actually think it was created in some ways by the Buddha, because he was very pragmatic in terms of just what worked and what could you verify yourself and what was helpful. And so anyway, just go. That's exactly correct. The problem that I see, though, with the pragmatic Dharma is, is that they're searching for something brand new because they're dissatisfied with the Buddhism that they've been given. Well, that's complicated, actually. So actually, yeah, it's very it hard to define pragmatic dharma. It's more of an attitude of what works. And actually, within pragmatic dharma circles, you find people like myself that spent a reasonable amount of time training in you know various monasteries with various traditional teachers and monks and, and all of that, and bow, bowing to Buddha statues and doing all of the things and chanting in Pali and doing very traditional stuff and reading extremely traditional texts, thousands of pages, and contemplating what these things might mean and going for very traditional attainments of various kinds and attempting to replicate traditional experiments from old books. And, and so, you know, but... It was always with the spirit of, is this useful and does it work and can I verify it for myself? And other people, like in the pragmatic, pragmatic dharma to them is cutting age, you know, very, you know, like gadgets and brain hacking and nootropics and but that's it's the same spirit of, implants <laughs> right or whatever, like it's the same biofeedback and all of those things and, and it's the same spirit of like, what actually helps reduce suffering? And where do I find that for myself? Which really, from my point of view, has always been the point, has always been part of the spirit, has always been the key question. And so in some ways, it's not new. In some ways, pragmatic dharma is perennial. Right. In fact, drugs fit in there someplace that people tried drugs for a while, thinking that that was going to be the answer. But then they moved on because they found out that that too is not satisfying. It's not satisfactory. And so that's what the point that I'm making is, is what keeps the wheel of samsara going is the fact that every point of the cycle that we're on, people are dissatisfied at that point and want something new, want to change it, uh, et cetera, like that. And so um, part of that then is uh, the flow of back and forth between do we want um, lineage or do we not want lineage? Or do we want lineage in a new fashion or, or form or whatever like that? And the real point is not lineage or not lineage. And it's not drugs or brain caps or whatever like that. The real issue is satisfaction. When people begin to find satisfaction in their lives, they're going in the right direction. So long as Western Buddhism remains dissatisfied and unsatisfied with what they've gotten so far and keep wanting to make it better and fix it, they're just being ordinary. That's what ordinary people do all the time is just taking something, not liking it and wanting a better copy or making it fixed or get a, a better one. My Very $5 true. watch. Hmm? Very true. Yes, my $5 watch is not good enough. I want a $50 watch. $50 watch, not good enough. I want a $150 watch. That's not good enough. I want a $1,000 watch. No, I want a Rolex. That's five. No, I want a $50,000 watch. I want some diamonds in there. And we keep wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting. And the whole point was, is that we could have been satisfied with a $5 watch. We could have been satisfied without wearing one. I don't wear a watch. I don't need them. Okay, so uh, the whole point about Western Sangha is, is that we're going to have to learn to be friends and to be satisfied with the way things are, each one of us, rather than trying to fix something that we can perceive as broken. Like perceiving, for instance, you know, sometimes uh, you have medical quacks and sometimes you don't. That's just how things are. 
And so when we get used to in an individual level, that my job then is to know the difference between a quack and a real doctor. And I don't need his qualifications or his university degrees or where he's been. I can tell a good doctor when I look at one. Well, actually, it's interesting. There are lots of statistics that are becoming more available um, in terms of things like infection rate and complication rate and recovery times. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, th there are all kinds of metrics now that they're attempting to judge care by. It's actually an extremely complicated topic as someone who was for some years in, um, an assistant medical director of a major level one trauma center, looking at how we use metrics and numbers and data to attempt to increase quality. It was interesting. Some of the, it, it was very, very challenging because for example, like is a fast doctor a good doctor? Well, if you've got people in your waiting room who need beds and might die of a heart attack in your waiting room if you don't get them back, a fast doctor might be a good doctor. Right, triage, is, right. We hold want on. him in triage. But is <laughs> it maybe, but is a slow doctor a good doctor? Because they may take more time and explain more things to the patient and really listen and take a more careful history. Maybe that's a better doctor. Like is a kind doctor a better doctor that does whatever the patient wants and, and just listens. And if the patient wants this, they do this. And if the patient wants that, they do that and gives them this medicine if that's what the patient wants. Or or is this is sort of a strict, um, like, you know, doctor, a good doctor that maybe doesn't give out opiate prescriptions that didn't need to be given out and maybe does like, you know, not do needless tests that really didn't need to be done? Is is a public health conscious doctor a good doctor where they're really thinking about, like, is this effective for the healthcare system or is a very patient centered doctor, a good doctor that is really thinking about that patient before them right there, regardless of any financial considerations. Like, and, and so the problem is every sort of metric along which you might try to measure what a good doctor is, you, you could definitely sort of start seeing some things like the surgeons who have a whole lot more infections. Maybe they've got a, you know, there are certain metrics that, that, you know, you know, like might be useful, but a lot of the ones that you might think are helpful are not. And consequently, I at least these days appreciate the diversity because I actually think that there, well, I know for certain there are definitely people that their aesthetics like certain teachers and they like certain practices and they like certain styles and they like certain um, relationships to ethics or to language. They like looser language. They like more informal language. They like more formal language. They, they, like, they like trappings. They like statues and incense or they like it just, no, none of that stuff, right? And the thing is to have, to reach all of the people that I think need this stuff, you actually need a diversity of voices. You need a diversity of styles. And then the question is, how do you find the quality within that? It gets, it does get complicated. And I myself am actually incredibly reluctant to give anybody a designation that they have a certain attainment or whatever. I actually think it's one of the worst things you can do is to prematurely call an attainment um, for someone when they may not have it. You know, and if wanting the an attainment is a terrible thing to do. Sure, wanting right. Rather something than just is a wanting terrible this thing. That's Duca wanting something right. you don't have. Why don't we just sure. be satisfied with the way things are and stop wanting things? It's powerful dharma. Your your profet your point is profound, and that's one of the most interesting things is when you actually see people who month after month, year after year, are confident and satisfied in their practice. That in of itself is, in some ways, its own mark of something beautiful. They're like, wow, it's still the beautiful thing that I understood about this moment. And it's still transient. It's still causal. It's still, you know, um, you know, those are the beautiful words that light up a Dharma teacher's ears. But, um, you know, uh, you know, we go, okay, efficacy, beautiful, wonderful, marvelous, excellent, sadhu. You know, you, you, there's that sense of of that, but even then, one has to be extremely careful. Um, and, and so, I just just recognize this is a very very complex topic. But I, I I am in my own aesthetics a little skeptical of the people who are certain that they are 100% qualified to judge others and to to be 100% certain that other people are are don't have some suffering reduction to contribute to this world, or 100% certain that someone might be purely delusional or 100% certain that someone has no value as a teacher or literally knows nothing about the Dhamma it, um, because of aesthetic considerations or whatever. That 100% certainty, I, I think we just need to, to <laughs> all check ourselves a little bit 
and, and try to be a little bit less that way. If we possibly can, that would be what I would advocate for, recognizing that we still have to make decisions and we still will have our tastes and aesthetics and preferences and opinions. Those things arise like the weather. Anyway, so that's what I would say. That sounded like a little bit of a sum up uh, in a way, yeah, Daniel. I'm I don't happy know to call would... that a sum up. I'm happy to leave that as my sum up. Okay, if okay. that serves as, as, as your sum up, um, Damarato, perhaps shall we end it here? And if so, um, what would be your two minute uh, summation or I, final I, I statement I on the matter? I can't, I better shut up now because I can't do it in two minutes, but I'll get started. All right. And let's get started. Let's go back to Daniel talking about 100%. And uh, the first one that he mentioned was 100% uh, sure that you can be qualified to judge others or other things like this. I remember Achan Po doing this more than many, many times. He had the habit of, of walking by me, especially if I wasn't paying attention or if I wasn't, you know, if my field of view was not 360 degrees, if he could find a way to sneak up on me, he would, and just make a word and pass by. And one of the things that he would often say was, not sure. He would just walk up and say, not sure. I got used to that, and so I was watching for him. He didn't show up so much anymore because I'd gotten his message, uh, both you better watch up because I'm going to sneak up on you if you don't watch. And the other one was this quality of being okay with not sure, that in fact the last fetter is the fetter of ignorance. We've got to get used to the fact that we're going to be not sure about everything. That's why we keep investigating. We keep looking and we don't. In fact, I would go, go so far as to say, I can be 100% sure that this very moment is okay. But I'm not really sure about anything else. But I can be 100% sure that this moment is okay too because the other one just passed and I've got a new one and this one's okay too. That's the way that we can look at it in, in that sense is having that surety or that confidence that we can handle this situation. But when it comes to dealing or judging other people, I'm 100 or pretty close to being sure that that's not a wise thing for me to do. It's dangerous. And so I should not go around judging other people. Then, in fact, that's a major point uh, of that another one of those high fetters, which is conceit, is to think that we know something's better for someone than they know themselves rather than to recognize that the only thing that I've got to take care of is whether this mind is clean or is it polluted with judging other people. So we, uh, the, the whole idea about doctors and certifications and getting a good medical profession going and uh, doing a lot of statistics so that we can get them better and better and better and better um, is a very ordinary Western kind of thing to do, and I'm sure that civilization will continue to improve. But let us hope along the way that a few of us also check out of that getting things better, living a critical life and critical of ourselves and the world and better than other people, and get into a state of nurturing and satisfaction to where everything is okay. And I don't have to worry about fixing anything because nothing's broken. Everybody's my friend. I don't have any enemies. Some people think they are, but we can fix that. I wanted to say one thing about even the infection risk statistic. So there are surgeons who take on tougher cases, much more challenging, much higher risk, and they might have higher complication rates because they were also brave enough to take on very challenging cases. So even that statistic is, is problematic sometimes if you don't understand what their patient mix is like and what kind of risks they were willing to take for patients to try mm -hmm. to help them in very challenging cases, right? So even that one, you've got to be careful. Like, so anyway, so judging others, it's a, I realized when I was attempting to figure out how in the world to do this, it is a very, very hard thing. Um, even when you have things like numbers, which we would think would be so reliable from our Western point of view, not easy. And I think the same in the Dhamma, like, you know, there are teachers who are willing to take on very challenging cases who are having very powerful, complicated experiences. Like, 
you would expect a higher complication rate from that sometimes, um, you know, because it's just, it's a, it's a different population of people coming to them. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that. I, I hear you talking about complications and uh, difficulties and confusions and, and all of that kind of stuff. And again, I see that is kind of ordinary way of looking at things to where the fact is, is that everything is already OK. Everything is already fine. And if we can become satisfied with the way things are, then we can spread that satisfaction to other people. But in fact, if a patient is satisfied with their doctor, they're doing a whole lot better than someone who goes from one specialist to another specialist to another specialist and remains unsatisfied. What we need is to teach satisfaction, not better Dhamma. We don't look for better teachers. We look for all the teachers enjoying themselves with each other's company. And it doesn't matter what they're teaching. What matters is that spark of friendship, that satisfaction. It's really hard to get satisfaction out of a book. <laughs> but you could get satisfaction by being around people who teach satisfaction. And by the way, satisfaction is exactly dukkha naroda. Dukkha is being dissatisfied. When you go around being satisfied, that's dukkha naroda. That's all we really need to do is to, instead of getting off of the wheel of samsara, we just enjoy the ride. Because it's going to go around and around and around and around. And all we have to do is just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the show, especially if they've got some friends. That's okay. really all about it. The whole show is friendship. That's what we need. That's lineage is when we've got friends got family. Damarato and Daniel, thank you for this very thought-provoking and collegial uh, conversation on the subject of uh, lineage. Who may teach the authentic Dharma? I think it's been so fascinating and I just want to say thank you very much to both of you for being so generous with your time and participating as you've done. Anybody needs a Dharma teacher, I've got a couple of dogs here. <laughs> <laughs> Damarato and Daniel Ingram, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, Damarato. it's been delightful. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And yeah. thank you, Steve. Let us do some more of this. Let's get some sangha going here. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.